This one we found one time ago, so I can see it in the next one. The title of this lecture is uh, Intriguing Provenance Trumps, I don't know what they refer to. Provenance Trumps, <laughs> Loyalty, Memory, and Public Belief Opinion in Early Modern Let me tell you a bit about, uh, about him. He was an undergraduate at Baylor College, Oxford, where he was an undergraduate and then stayed all the way through to do his, uh, his, uh, his bill. Um, after which he made a research fellowship at Sheffield University and then took up academic posts at, uh, first at the University of Manchester and then at the University of Liverpool where he stayed for six years until 2009. Uh, I'm very pleased to say he joined us here in Roehampton as a reader in early modern history. And in what looks like a really incredibly short space of time, he had established a truly outstanding reputation as a historian of early modern England, with a particular interest in popular political culture and radicalism during the 17th century. This deep hill thesis became a book published in 2005, Revolutionary England and the National Covenant, State Oaths, Protestantism and Liberation. That was followed by history, uh, another book, History of the Revolution of 1688, Glorious Revolution, 1688 in Britain's Fight for Liberty. And then in 2009, we had another book, A Radical History of Britain, Visionaries, Rebels, and Revolutionaries, the men and women who fought for our freedoms. And that's the first single volume narrative of British radicalism right from the Magna Carta up until present day. And alongside those books, he's published numerous chapters and books, and edited books, and uh, articles in, in some uh, leading journals such as the English Historical Review and the Journal of British Studies. Ted's uh, written in particular on the Glorious Revolution of 1688 and on the Levellers and the Putney debate of 1647, both one of the most celebrated events in the English Civil War and a fundamental part not just of our own local history here in uh, South West London, uh, but central to the history of democracy in our country. And uh, we're going to hear more of the public debates. No? Sorry, no. but yeah. He's moved on. Ted has gained, uh, as I said, a terrific reputation, and I was delighted that we, uh, in November 2014, were able to recognise his achievements by promotion to a personal chair. And in addition to his more academic writings, we think Ted's become a regular contributor to public discussions and public debates regarding Britain's radical traditions, helping the general audience to understand the events of contemporary society by putting them into a wider historical context. He's an active member of the Historical Association and a regular contribution to the Guardian, the New Statesman, and BBC History Magazine, and to be found on BBC Radio and BBC Television Series. And thanks to Ted, I've been, I've been looking at uh, something that Guardian readers know that Jeremy Corbyn resembles John Lilburn, one of the levelers at the Putney debates. PJ e. Harvey is part of a long line of radical protests in a nation built on bloodshed. And he's given Al Jazeera's, Al Jazeera's audience an historical perspective on London riots. And in history, uh, years ago, Ask the question, can MPs be trusted to think for themselves? I think we'll know that. Ted is also, on top of all that, a terrific teacher and uh, uh, a great contributor to life in the department and life in the White University. We're very pleased to have him as a colleague. Please welcome Professor Ted Dunn. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, for that very generous um, introduction. Um, there, there isn't, um, as I said, there isn't a, a reference to the Putney debates in this lecture, but there is a reference to Jeremy Corbyn, so um, we'll be pleased to, to hear that. Um, just to explain, I, I've put this slide up, not because I'm a massive narcissist, um, but to kind of set the background a little bit for, for, for this talk. Um, the talk is about my latest uh, book project, and the themes of this talk bring together a couple of things that I've been working on 
um, in terms of my research. W one of those is uh, I I'm, I'm obsessed with things that people sign uh, or, or mark their name on, what we call subscriptional texts. So I started off being obsessed with oaths. And for those of you who are also obsessed with oaths, there is a reference to oaths in the lecture as well. Um, but uh, as Paul said, I've also become obsessed with radicals, and in particular the memory of radicals, and memory studies more, more generally. So that the picture is up here because that's actually me in front of the Judge's Cave, um, which is in West Rock Park, um, just outside of New Haven, Connecticut. And this is where two of the regicides, William Goff and Edward Wally, were supposed to have hidden uh, from royalist agents as they were chased over New England um, in the 1660s. So I've, I've been doing some work on, on the memory of the regicides, and a little bit of that we'll touch, um, I'll touch on in this paper. So um, Paul said the, 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 the uh, title uh, may have intrigued some of you, um, and I need to begin this uh, lecture, as many academic lectures begin, with an apology, which is to tell you that I'm not actually going to be talking about Oliver Cromwell's uh, choice of swimwear. We don't know whether he favoured Speedos or Bermuda shorts, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm not talking about that, and I'm not, in fact, uh, talking uh, about uh, Oliver. I'm talking about these sorts of trunks, not this trunk specifically. We don't have a picture of the trunk I'm talking about. Um, and this Cromwell, that is Richard Cromwell, Oliver's third son, and the second Lord Protector, who uh, achieved that title after his father's death in September of 1658. Now, as some of you may know, uh, Richard had a very short reign as Lord Protector. He was ousted from office um, by the army in May of 1659, and hence he's known and was known at the time as Tumble Down Dick because of this very uh, short period in office. And this is where uh, the trunks come in uh, during this moment of Richard's fall from power. In his History of Addresses, published in 1709, the Whig historian and pamphleteer John Oldmixon reported that as two men were assisting Richard Cromwell in clearing his belongings from his protectoral lodgings, Richard instructed them to take special care of, quote, two old trunks. The men, Oldmixon said, wondered why he was so solicitous for their preservation, since by their appearance and the place they were put in, they did not seem to contain a treasure of such consequence. And one of his friends, hearing him inquire after them with more concern than for any other part of the lumber, asked him what was in them that made him value them so much. Why no less, says Richard, than the lives and fortunes of all the good people of England. It seems that the loyal addresses that have been presented to him were thrown in there, and we all know that it is a poor address that has not lives and fortunes in it. Similar stories were repeated by other 18th century writers. The loyalist historian Mark Noble, in his late 18th century collected biography of the Cromwell family, reported that Cromwell liked to bring the trunk out as an after-dinner entertainment, encouraging guests to ride upon it, and then warning the uninitiated that they should take care because the chest carried the lives and fortunes of the English people within it. These tales may even have a germ of truth within them. In 1706, Richard Cromwell gave written instructions that his little chagrin trunk should be given on his death to his sister, Mary, Countess of Falkenberg, prompting modern biographers to wonder whether this was the trunk full of addresses mentioned by Old Mixon and Noble. And uh, the other famous thing about Richard Cromwell, which is sadly no longer true, it's not famous, but it's my favourite kind of pub quiz uh, bit of historical knowledge, he was the longest reigning British head of state. Didn't die until 1712, but unfortunately he's just been beaten by our present queen. So he's now the second longest lived British head of state. So what do those anecdotes tell us about uh, the Lord Addresses, or Richard Cromwell? Well, more I'll suggest than that Richard Cromwell would have made a great contestant on Come Dine With Me. For writers such as Old Mixon and Noble, these stories about Richard were employed to question the credibility of a particular form of early modern political mass media, the Loyal Address. Loyal Addresses were petition-like texts, ostensibly produced to deliver praise 
thanks or congratulations to authority. Richard Cromwell's addresses were invoked to show that these texts gave no indication of genuine public support. As the Whig pamphlet, an impartial account of the nature and tendency of the late addresses published in 1681, stated, quote, no application of this nature to the regnant person are to be esteemed of any great weight or significancy if you do but consider the result of many addresses three and twenty years ago to Richard Cromwell, and how they only served to render him secure till he was undermined and supplanted. For of all the 1,600,000 that vowed to live and die by him, not so much as one man drew a sword in his favour when he came to be laid aside. Some contemporaries put it even more succinctly. The Earl of Lauderdale told King Charles II that addresses, quote, were fit for nothing but to wipe his royal arse. Until recently, historians have been equally unconvinced of the value of these texts. The 19th century editor of Thomas Burton's Diary of the Protectoral Parliaments, J.T. Rutt, described addresses as mere, quote, vehicles of servile adulation. What I want to argue in this lecture, however, is that the story of Richard Cromwell's addresses, far from showing us that these texts were vacuous ephemera, demonstrates the importance of loyal addresses for understanding public opinion in later Stuart England. I'll begin by looking at the Cromwellian addresses in their immediate context. While we will see that there is evidence of the addressing campaign in support of Richard's protectorate being directed from the centre, in order for these campaigns to be successful, they required the buy-in of local elites and office holders. Through exploring one address to Richard from Leicestershire, we'll see that his regime struggled to secure widespread approval in the locality, and what support there was was equivocal at best. Contemporaries were therefore correct in suggesting that the addresses to Richard did not give a clear indication of the support he enjoyed in the country. I'll show, however, that the addresses do reveal much about the problems of legitimacy faced by Richard's regime and present us with what was effectively a Cromwellian succession crisis. As the addresses also reveal, these political divisions were further complicated by disputes over the nature of the Cromwellian church settlement. In the second part of the lecture, I'll move on to explore the impact of the memory of these Cromwellian addresses. Here I'll suggest that the peculiar characteristics of Lord addresses, in contrast to other similar genres such as petitions, facilitated the rapid development of a public memory of addressing activity. In the specific context of another succession crisis, the so-called exclusion crisis of 1678 to 81, Lord addressing's Cromwellian origin myth served a number of purposes. First, it provided opportunities for attacking individuals and communities on the basis of their past political conduct. Second, it allowed critics of the Stuart Court to make effective use of rhetorical strategies usually deployed by their opponents, namely invoking the memory of the Civil War and Interregnum. Finally, and most importantly, it was used to differentiate between legitimate and illegitimate popular political activity. Yet despite their often highly polemical nature, disputes over the history and memory of loyal addresses helped fashion a significant political consensus. This acknowledged the role of the public as a political arbiter, while essentially upholding the limitations placed upon popular petitioning and addressing activity by the Restoration Settlement. This consensus, I'll suggest, continues to inform British political culture today. So what are these texts that I'm talking about? At the most basic level, loyal addresses were texts which offered the thanks and congratulations of a particular group or community to authority. In a parliamentary context, a loyal address was the traditional form in which communications from the two houses were presented to the Crown. And this form continues to be the way in which formal congratulations are delivered to the monarch. Um, when the present Queen had her Diamond Jubilee in 2012, 27 so-called privileged bodies presented her with loyal addresses. These range from uh, religious bodies to um, uh, you know, particular corporations and so forth. 17th century observers, however, did not always distinguish between addresses and other forms of political communication. Addressing was treated as being very closely related to petitioning, and the terms address and petition were occasionally treated as synonyms of each other. One example of this was the 1661 Act against tumultuous petitioning, 
whose full title was, quote, an act against tumults and disorders upon pretense of preparing or presenting public petitions or other addresses to His Majesty or the Parliament. And I'll return to that statute a bit later in this lecture. The failure to discriminate between these forms of political communication was understandable given their shared features. Both petitions and addresses could be used to present criticisms to authority or demands um, upon those in power. Both petitions and addresses could be employed in coordinated national campaigns. And these sorts of campaigns could provoke counter-petitioning and counter-addressing movements. In one very important respect, however, loyal addresses were different. Though these guidelines were often ignored in practice, legitimate petitioning was governed by a number of principles concerning the matter of the request being made, the direct involvement of the petitioners in that matter, and the form in which the petition was delivered to Parliament. One significant feature of a legitimate petition to Parliament was that it was supposed to be a private communication between the petitioners and their elected representatives. The printed petitions which proliferated during the Civil War represented a violation of these privacy norms because they seemingly appealed to an audience beyond Parliament, the public, and invited criticism of the representative body should it not deem the petition worthy of discussion. In contrast, addressing as an activity ostensibly supposed to convey thanks or congratulations was governed by no clear secrecy norms. Indeed, addressing was an inherently very public activity. The presentation of a loyal address formed part of a public ceremonial in which the adulation of the subject was returned with the thankfulness of the ruler. The Cromwellian peer and lawyer, Bulstrode Whitlock, for example, recorded with barely concealed pride that he had been, quote, pitched upon by the gentlemen and freeholders of Buckinghamshire to present the county's address to Richard Cromwell, which he noted the new protector received with, quote, a very good prudent answer. Addressing was also an expensive activity. The Guestling or Brotherhood of the Sink Ports, for example, which is the ancient body that represented all of the ports and their associated towns, spent £20 for 10 of its me members to travel to Windsor to present their address to Charles II in 1683. And to try and translate that into modern terms, if you use the TNA's currency calculator, it tells you that means about £1,670 in 2005 terms. Obviously, in terms of actual sort of spending power and wages, it amounts to a much larger sum of money. James Day Bell has noted that petitioning, petitionary activity carried features of gift exchange, and this was literally true in the case of some addresses, which were accompanied by cash gifts to the Crown. Expenditure of this kind was justified because a well-received address might help secure important concessions from authority, and in the case of the presenters themselves, could be a route to personal preferment. My drinking problems got in here. Um, Francis Withams, who delivered the Westminster Address to Charles II in 1682, was knighted for his loyal services in presenting an address. Loyal London apprentices who addressed Charles the year before were rewarded with a brace of bucks from the king himself, leading hostile newsletters to complain that their, quote, cackling loyalty had been bought with venison. In fact, the deer represented only a very minor part of the treating of these loyal lads. The feast held in their honour was reputed to have cost £750, um, which again, on that calculator, works out as uh, £62,655 in 2005 terms, so an enormous sum of money in terms of the monetary values of the day. Even if no material rewards resulted from the act of addressing, it was clearly an activity that was important to individuals' personal sense of honour and identity. Not only Bulstrow Whitlock, but other diarists and journal keepers, such as Thomas Rugg and Elizabeth Freak, paid particular attention to capturing addressing activity in their texts. The act of presenting the address itself afforded the presenters with direct access to the king, or in the case of the Lord Protector, Chief Magistrate. This access became increasingly precious in the Restoration period, as the Crown came to employ both household orders and rework palace architecture to carefully filter who could and could not have an audience with the monarch. As these efforts to limit access show, not all approaches were welcome, and addresses which were deemed to be too critical or presented by those of too low status could meet with a hostile response. 
As the recorder of the city of Leicester, James Wynne Stanley, put it in a reference to the city's address to Richard Cromwell, quote, such notice is taken of all those things, more than ordinary compliments and congratulations, that if they be not presented in an eminent and cordial grand way, there is much notice taken of them by his highness and council. There were then potential risks as well as benefits to presenting an address. For a party of Baptist ministers who delivered an address to James II in 1686, thanking him for a royal pardon which had freed them from jail, this moment in the royal presence brought humiliation rather than honour. The diarist Roger Morris reported that the Baptist ministers were, quote, kept long upon their knees, a quarter of an hour almost, while His Majesty showed the petition to several about him while they were very merry. Though, as we'll see, communities and groups did use these seemingly loyal texts to deliver criticisms, addresses also formed an important part of state propaganda. In the 1650s, addresses were publicised via government-controlled newsletters, such as Mercurius Politicus, the Public Intelligencer, and the Protectorate's French language newsletter, Nouvelle Ordinaire de Londres. And there is that text. And as that last title also demonstrates, addressing activities being used here not just to represent the legitimacy of the protectoral regime nationally, but also internationally. The presence of these addresses in popular print was significant. As Godfrey Davis suggested, the regular practice of reproducing addresses in printed newsletters more than central coordination contributed much to the homogeneity of addresses as texts, as corporations and counties played a political game of follow the leader. Copying earlier successful addresses was also a way of avoiding the mortifying encounter experienced by the Baptist ministers in 1686. The idea that addresses were delivering the sense or voice of the nation was sustained by the fact that unlike petitions, addresses were not supposed to be vehicles for conveying specific local concerns. Addresses occasioned by a particular national event, the birth of a royal child, the accession of a new monarch, a military victory, or the sealing of a peace treaty, were inevitably likely to be more uniform and cohesive. Subscriptional texts such as petitions, but particularly, I'd argue, addresses, had the potential to foster national debate and fashion a sense of public opinion as a cohesive entity. This has led some historians to see them as integral to the emergence of a public sphere for critical political discussion. In these texts, scholars have seen an empirical basis for Jürgen Habermas's claim that the, this public sphere first emerged in early modern England. David Zarrett has seen the proliferation of printed mass petitions during the Civil War as providing the basis for a more democratic political culture. According to Zarrett, petitioning effectively constituted a public sphere as framers of petitions, quote, produced text for an anonymous audience of readers, a public presumed not only to be capable of rational thought, but also to possess moral competency for resolving rival political claims. Mark Knights, whose work follows on chronologically from Zarrett's investigation of petitioning in the 1640s, also sees petitioning and addressing as enabling greater political participation. However, Knights is more conscious about the, uh, cautious about the degree to which these changes were sustained over time and the extent to which they, were, they altered normative assumptions about the role of the public in political debate. Though the fact of greater popular participation was indisputable, the value of that involvement remained uncertain. Many feared that what these addressing campaigns really demonstrated was the ease with which the public could be swayed not by reason, but by partisan polemic. My approach in this project seeks to contribute to this debate about the early modern public sphere through engaging with some more recent studies of communication, namely those by Michael Warner and Gerald Hauser. In the context of the political turbulence of the 17th century, the very public nature of loyal addresses and the way in which addressing activity followed major national political events meant that addresses clearly display the two characteristics Warner has identified as being vital to the development of modern publics, temporality and reflexivity. Addressing was temporarily structured through the reproduction of texts in newsletters and, and newspapers, and it was also highly reflexive in that these texts were in turn reproduced, collated and editorialised. Gerard Howes' work on modern publics in turn offers an important corrective to Habermas's emphasis on the rule of reason debate in the public sphere. Hauser 
in contrast, sees fierce polemic polemical exchanges as potential evidence of a well-functioning rather than a faulty public sphere. Similarly, beneath the often vituperative exchanges between early modern writers lay, I'll suggest, considerable agreement about the limits of legitimate subscriptional activity. So, as you can see from this um, page from Mark Knight's, uh, his work I just men mentioned, Representation Misrepresentation, these kinds of campaigns carry on after the 1650s on into the early 18th century. And that prol proliferation of these texts at least says at a basic level that the state recognised the need to appear to have some level of public support. They were recognition too, arguably, that in an era when the state was dependent upon the unacknowledged republic of unpaid office holders, as Mark Goldies described it, power was exercised through a process of negotiation between the centre and the periphery. Yet while the texts of thousands of loyal addresses can be found in contemporary newspapers produced in late 17th and early 18th century England, and this gives you some indication of the frequency of this terminology picking up during the later 17th century, original manuscript addresses are much rarer, especially those texts that still retain subscriptions. One surviving example, containing roughly a thousand names, is the address of the, sorry, <laughs> is the address of the well-affected, uh, I'm glad that joke worked, is the address of the well-affected inhabitants of Leicestershire to Richard Cromwell. That's just one of the many visual gags that will follow in the rest of this lecture. The description of the addresses as well affected, you probably can't read the top there, um, engaged with the common use of a term to describe the supporters of the parliamentarian side. And as Rachel Weil has shown, this term well affected was meant to capture the idea of both internal as well as external allegiance and loyalty. These are people who are ideologically committed to the cause. And we can note a contrast here for, with the address from the city of Leicester, which I've just mentioned earlier, which didn't make use of this language of well-affected, but instead simply described the text as coming from the mayor, alderman, ministry, gentry, and commonality of that borough. So much more matter-of-fact, not using this kind of ideological language. The names that immediately follow this text of the county's address add further to the sense of this as a sectional document. One of the first subscribers was the regicide Francis Hacker, MP for the county in Richard Cromwell's parliament. And nom nominative determinism fans, Hacker is not the man who cut Charles I's head off. That's not why he was counted a regicide. Uh, that's not the reason, I'm afraid. Well, he's one of the early names on that list, which is followed by significant local parliamentarians, John Goodman and William Hartrop along with many Puritan ministers, such as John Yaxley of Kibworth, who was accused after the Restoration of preaching and praying for the execution of Charles I. Now, I've also undertaken a sophisticated mapping exercise here. Uh, you'll see how sophisticated it in, is in a moment. Um, to look at the places that are actually um, named on this address. Uh, and it's this elaborate <laughs> audiovisual. Uh, transition there. Now what you can probably see here is there's some pretty big gaps and there's also this question mark over Leicester itself. And the reason why there's a question mark is that although there, there was an address claiming to come from the, the mayor and commonality and all the rest of it of Leicester, if you look at those folios of the address that's described in its first pages as the county address, in later folios it starts calling itself the address of the town and county of Leicester. So there's a sense here that there's competing addresses both claiming to speak for this particular city. But what we can see here is that there are these notable gaps and there are also major towns like Ashby de la Zouche, Nuneaton and Loughborough which don't feature on this address at all. And what's significant here is that these areas map very closely onto areas of royalist strength during the Civil War. So we seem to have kind of allegiance being mapped out here in these areas where the address was taken. So that might lead us to think that the address was the product of Cromwellian zealots. But the picture revealed by the address itself, once we start dipping into the individual subscriptions, is more complex than this. 
The first pages of the address appear to have been subscribed by those identified as figures of some status within the county. Yes, along with regicides and godly ministers, we can find the names of leading royalists such as the Brudenals and Beaumonts. While it's difficult to gather information on all of those who subscribed, the 52 ministers whose names feature within it can be researched in greater detail. Some of these ministers did have clear and strong ties to the parliamentarian cause. Jeb Gray, rector of South Kilworth, was the brother of the Earl of Kent, who along with, the Lord, with Lord Gray of, I think it's pronounced Gruby, although it's also spelt Groby, represented the major parliamentarian aristocracy in the area. Johnson Nicholas, rector of Lutterworth, had, like his brother, the lawyer and poet Thomas St Nicholas, been nominated to the Bare Bones Parliament of 1653. This was the Parliament of you know, nominated godly members. Matthew Clark, Minister of Narborough, had served as a new model army chaplain. But while we can identify 14 ministers on the address who became non-conformists after the restoration of monarchy, their number was exceeded by those ministers, 18 in all, who retained their livings after 1660. These included men such as William Cotton, Minister of Broughton Ashley, the son of Thomas Cotton Esquire, Lord of Loughton Manor. He inherited a 12-room parsonage from his father and an annual income of £200. Cotton was nonetheless a signatory to both the address of 1658 to Richard Cromwell and a 1659 address to the restored Commonwealth. Despite these previous public commitments to the First Protectorate and then the revived English Republic, Cotton retained his living until his death in 1691, and he has been identified by one historian as the epitome of the gentry clergyman in Restoration Leicestershire. Those clergy listed on the return even included several deemed scandalous by the parliamentarian authorities. Thomas Sturges, sometime vicar of Higham, was sequestered for scandal and drunkenness by the county committee in 1646 charged with being too inebriated to officiate on repeated occasions, and even worse, for letting his family play games on a Sunday. Charges of drunkenness made against ministers by parliamentary county committees were commonplace and need to be viewed with some scepticism. Thomas Bird, the sequestered minister of Summerby, for example, was accused of ripping his surplus while engaged in a bout of drunken hair coursing, and even worse, then attempting to get his parishioners to pay for a replacement. Uh, charges which, it should be stressed, Bird denied. Nonetheless, it's notable that Sturges, who I mentioned, didn't regain his living post-restoration, apparently on so-called moral grounds, though he continued to reside in the area, dying in 1667. So though this Cromwellian return featured a smattering of godly ministers, it also featured men such as Edward Penton, minister of Bruntingthorpe, recorded by Parliament surveyors as being weak, negligent, and worldly. Looking beyond the clergy, the subscription return suggests that the secular subscribers represented an equally mixed bunch. In some parishes, such as Gilmorton, there was a very close correlation between those who subscribed the 1658 address and the names that appeared on the Lady Day half tax return six years later. And so it's time to sound the half tax faxon. I told you there'd be more audiovisual stimulation here. So the half tax is, is a tax, as it says, on halves, um, and it has been used to try and assess wealth and poverty, and there are people in this room who know much more about it than I do. But what I've been doing with it is just comparing that 1664 return and the 1658 ad address and looking for similarities in terms of the names. So we can fi find in parishes like Gilmorton there's a very close correlation. Significant property holders seem to be um, on the address and on the, on, on the half tax return. But in other parishes, such as Melton Mowbray and Cadaby, which is illustrated up here, the names on that list are completely different, suggesting that major householders couldn't be persuaded to give their support to Richard Cromwell's regime. The instructions on the address itself indicate that no direction was given as to who should or should not subscribe to the text. The constable of Higham being directed by the justices of the county simply to, quote, make all your neighbours acquainted with it and see who will subscribe. The role of magistrates in administering these addresses may also explain the patchy nature of the Leicestershire return. A letter from the leading royalist, Edward Nicholas, to John Evelyn in October of 1658 indicated that judges were refusing to take up their offices until Richard's title as Lord Protector had been formally recognised by his parliament. 
These difficulties in securing the backing of local office holders are also reflected in the problems encountered by James Wynne Stanley with the Leicester City Address. Unable to get any members of the Borough Corporation to accompany the address to Whitehall, Wynne Stanley was forced to, quote, gather up such as I could find fit persons in habit and gravity to present it. And this included having to grab his cousin and so on and get them to come forward and present this text. Now, the text of the Leicestershire Address did at least give a fairly full recognition of Richard's title, describing him as the rightful successor according to the Second Protectoral Constitution, the humble petition and advice. As with the use of the term well affected, we could see this use of the language of the protectorate supporters as being largely strategic, being employed as a way by those who are not really ideologically committed to the regime, but who nonetheless wanted to avoid any kind of reprisals and failing to recognise it. And certainly counties that did fail to proclaim Richard as protector, such as nearby Rutland and Northamptonshire, were very firmly told to, uh, reminded of their duty to do so by the Council of State. In other counties, such as Dorset, office holders were clearly seeking advice from reading Cromwellians, such as the newsletter writer Marchmont Nedham, about the content of these law and addresses, how to frame them, when to produce them, what their content should be. Now, the subject of Richard Cromwell's succession to the protectoral title has recently become a topic of renewed scholarly interest. Peter Gaunt and Jason Pesey have made the case for Richard being identified as successor through his increasingly public and prominent role before Oliver's death in September of 1658, and one of those roles was being appointed Chancellor of the University of Oxford. Jonathan Fitzgibbons, on the other hand, has cast serious doubt on whether Oliver ever formally named Richard as his heir. Um, Oliver was very ill in those last few days of his life. Whether or not Oliver did name his son a successor, many of the addresses produced to Richard in late 1658, early 1659, certainly indicate that there was considerable public doubt about the new protector's legitimacy. This becomes clear if we look at the basis on which Richard was proclaimed Lord Protector in September 1658. The proclamation, acknowledging the providence of God in taking away his father's life, declared that Oliver had named Richard as protector, quote, according to the humble petition and advice, and declared him, quote, rightful protector of England, Ireland and Scotland, due obedience according to the law. So the Leicestershire address was basically an echo of this official proclamation. While there was a muted reference to providence here in this official proclamation, the heaviest emphasis was laid on Richard's legal title as established by the Second Protectoral Constitution, which gave the protector the power to name his successor, subject to the approval by the Protectoral Council. In contrast, many of the addresses that appeared in the pages of Mercurius Politicus and the Public Intelligencer, including that from the city of Leicester, were laden with providential language. As the antiquary William Dugdale later put it, Oliver was compared to, quote, Moses, Zerubbabel, Joshua, Gideon, Elijah, to the chariots and horsemen of Israel, to David, Solomon, and Hezekiah, likewise to Constantine the Great, and to whomsoever else that either sacred scripture or any other history had celebrated for their piety and goodness. But the frequent resort to the language of providence in these addresses was not matched by the recognition of Richard's title as lawful under the terms of the humble petition and advice. The 44 non-military addresses published in the English language press only six made references to Richard being rightfully or lawfully protector, while just eight specifically mentioned the humble petition and advice. Nouvelle Ordinaire de Londres reproduced a further 26 addresses in full and provided short notices of another 24. Only half of those unexpurgated addresses provided any explicit acknowledgement of Richard's title. This emphasis on providence in these addresses not only avoided the question of the legality of the succession, but also arguably provided a vehicle for implicit criticism of Richard's suitability through overemphasizing the quality of his father. In the words of the Barnstable Address, that quote, choice jewel whereof the world was not worthy. The religious language of these addresses also pointed to confessional as well as political divisions. The text presented by Thomas Goodwin on behalf of above 100 congregational churches was delivered at the same time as the protector was given the Savoy Declaration. This declaration, drafted by Goodwin in conjunction with other leading independent divines, 
reminded the Protector of the Constitution's commitment to religious toleration and aimed at presenting the existing congregational way as compatible with the Presbyterian classes system nominally established as the national church structure in the 1640s. In contrast, some addresses such as that <coughs> from Sussex, oh, sorry, I don't know why I went up in pitch just then. I'm, 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 a, I'm uh, yeah, adopted Sussex as my, my home county, so uh, uh, I'm excited about mentioning it. Uh, called for the protector to encourage greater Christian union, a request which connected with current Presbyterian initiatives to secure an accommodation with independency. The problem was, for many uh, Presbyterians, accommodation basically meant the absorption of congregationalists within this Presbyterian system. Similarly, the address from the well-affected inhabitants of Taunton, Somerset, suggested that the toleration afforded under the Protectoral Constitution needed to be reined in, urging Richard to deal not only with those whose public behaviour was immoral, but also with those, quote, who being outwardly clear from the lusts of the flesh, are yet defiled with the lusts of the mind. This call for the vigorous monitoring of religious belief was in stark contrast to the address from England's Baptist churches, which mourned the elder Cromwell as, quote, a nursing father to their churches, but which also thanked the new protector, Richard, for his proclamation promising protection for tender consciences. The addresses to Richard were then clearly being employed as part of a confessional struggle between independency and Presbyterianism, and between the defenders of religious toleration and those who sought a more restrictive church settlement. The commonly held view that the new protector Richard was a more religiously conservative figure than his father may also partly explain the presence of so many conformist clergy on the Leicestershire return. Indeed, some of the godly ministers on the address were also less than tolerant. William Sheffield, rector of Ibstock, for example, held public disputations with local Baptists and was known for harrying the county's Quakers. The same conservative impulse rather than rank hypocrisy may explain the presence of former royalists on the address too. The Presbyterian minister Richard Baxter maintained that many individuals of a variety of religious and political persuasions welcomed Richard Cromwell's succession as providing the best chance of stability. Sir John Fitzjames both orchestrated Dorset's address to Richard Cromwell and also presented the county's congratulatory address to Charles II when he was restored to the throne. But before we label Fitzjames as a political turncoat, it's worth looking at how he promoted that Cromwellian address. Fitzjames's rationale was essentially the same as Baxter's. The address could help secure, he said, the unity and peace of the county, and would he expect it to be signed by all the peaceably minded. The hope that Richard Cromwell's rule would offer stability, of course, proved false. The addressing activity of 1658-9 nonetheless clearly left a powerful public memory. The return of monarchy was also greeted by loyal texts. Several counties that issued congratulatory addresses to Charles II felt obliged to excuse their past activity. The address from the city of Lincoln, for example, apologised, quote, that through the general defection of your majesty's subjects in this your kingdom from their allegiance, they were therein involved with the rest of your majesty's subjects and they appealed to the king's re recently issued general pardon and indemnity for absolution and protection. And this admission may have been related to the fact that Lincolnshire produced the largest address to Richard Cromwell, featuring a reported 6,000 names upon it. Now, I don't know how to pronounce this place, so apologies to anyone who, who's from there or knows it. The town of Oundle in Northamptonshire went a step further during their celebrations of Charles II's birthday on the 29th of May 1661, they not only burnt Oliver Cromwell in effigy, but also immolated, quote, the infamous address to Dick Cromwell that passed by the name of Northamptonshire. And if I can just quickly flip back, some of you may have noticed that somebody on the Leicestershire address cut their name out of that uh, particular folio. And there are several other folios where names appear to be missing, uh, perhaps as a way of protecting yourself um, from later recriminations. Whoa, there we go. Uh, <laughs> Several addresses highlighted their community's lack of involvement in previous addressing campaigns as evidence of unwavering loyalty. 
The petition from the mayors and bailiffs of the sink ports asserted that their reputation had never been tarnished, quote, by any address or application whatsoever to testify our assent to any government imposed upon us. Some of these expressions of loyalty beggared belief. One can only marvel at the sheer audacity of the army's address, which assured the king that these former parliamentarian soldiers were, quote, his majesty's best and most loyal subjects. One of the leading signatories to this address was Richard Inglesby, whose name had previously adorned Charles I's death warrant. The succession of loyal addresses and humble petitions which had accompanied the shift from protectorate to commonwealth to monarchy came to an end in 1661 with the passage of that tumultuous petitioning act. The preamble to the act identified popular petitioning activity as a cause of the, quote, late unhappy wars, confusions and calamities in this nation. It sought to restrict popular petitioning. Only petitions from 20 or more persons that had the approval of at least three magistrates or the majority of a grand jury were now lawful. Even before this bill passed into law, many of the congratulatory addresses sent to Charles II seemed determined to draw back from the overt populism of the Cromwellian addresses. Instead of seeking to emphasise the ideological commitment of those signing and or the number of subscribers, these addresses emphasise that they were socially exclusive produ uh, productions signed only by the gentry and nobility. And this is the one uh, from Dorset. And as you can see, it starts off uh, with peers going on to baronets, then the esquires, and then just the humble gentlemen. But if you look at the original in state papers, you'll see it doesn't really map out that way. Um, the arrow there is to indicate uh, John Fitzjames, who I mentioned earlier. So these kinds of jumbles are then sorted out in the printed editions to make clear the social hierarchy um, of the individuals subscribing. It would take another succession crisis, this time prompted by the conversion of Ro to Roman Catholicism of Charles II's brother and heir, James Duke of York, to revive popular petitioning and addressing. As Mark Knights has shown, supporters of the Whig Party, especially in London, used mass petitions to mobilise opposition to England being ruled once again by a Catholic monarch. In response, the Stuart Court rallied its supporters through successive loyal addressing campaigns. The court's propagandists also drew out the connections between the petitioning activity of the Civil War and the strategies of their Whig opponents. The leading Tory polemicist and also press censor Roger Lestrange in his A Seasonable Memorial of 1680 described popular petitioning as, quote, the most necessary link in the chain of a rebellion. Irrespective of the content of popular petitions, he said, they were always likely to provoke tumults. For the one, disorder is but the hot fit of the other popular petitioning. From first to last, Lestrange claimed the Civil War had been driven on mainly by petitions. The connections between Whig ideals and practices and mid-century radicalism was explicitly drawn in the King's Declaration explaining the dissolution of the Oxford Parliament in 1681. This paralleled attempts to exclude James from the throne with the regicide and warned of the threat posed by those attached to so-called Commonwealth principles, meaning the principles of the Civil War. As Mark Knights has noted, the addresses which followed this declaration were quick to pick up on this cue to engage with the memory of Civil War and Interregnum. But in this historically infused dispute, the memory of past addressing activity, specifically that under the Cromwellian Protectorate, provided the Whigs with a means of employing the history of the Civil War and Interregnum against their opponents. During the exclusion crisis, presumably as part of the general loyalist bid to connect Whig popular politics with the good old cause of the Civil War, the strange reprint reprinted some of his earlier works which had traced the origins of that conflict. One of these was his A Memento, originally published in 1662, and republished in 1688 in a slightly abbreviated edition. In this work, Lestrange commented on the addresses sent to Oliver Cromwell, describing them as no more than, quote, leagues offensive and defensive betwixt the faction and the usurper. These numerous and pretending applications were, Lestrange said, but false glosses upon his power, and Cromwell was too wise to think them other. They were gained by contrivement, force, or at least importunity. Half a score pitiful wretches call themselves the people of such and such a county, and here's the total of the reckoning. Similar texts, the strange noted, were brought in, quote, thick and threefold by the court interest to honour Richard Cromwell at his accession. 
but those compliments, he said, had no sap in them. These comments were soon picked up by newsletter writers and pamphleteers keen to discredit the addressing campaigns in support of the Stuart Court. The strangers' comments clearly begged the question as to the value and reliability of contemporary loyalist addresses, especially given the strangers' reputation as the wire puller orchestrating these campaigns, an image sustained in part by the strangers' own claims to have directed petitioning and addressing activity in support of the Restoration. As one pamphleteer argued, the, quote, very person that is principally employed in framing the drafts which were remitted into the country of loyal addresses had different thoughts concerning these texts some years ago when they came in shoals to Oliver Cromwell. The most telling blow was struck by the moderate clergyman Edward Pearce in his The Conformist Third Plea for the Nonconformist, which noted that Lestrange had been one of the signatories of a declaration to General George Monk in 1660, calling for a free parliament. Embarrassingly for the court's leading political attack dog, the address, published as a broadsheet in 1660, expressed the hope that, quote, all mentions of parties and faction and all rancor and animosities may be thrown in and buried like rubbish under the foundation. And that's the text itself. But these Cromwellian addresses were not simply being employed by Whig authors in an attempt to turn the history of the Civil War and interregnum against their opponents. By identifying addressing's du dubious origins, they also wanted to distinguish between this form of subscriptional activity and legitimate mass petitioning. For the author of the pamphlet An Impartial Account, it was addressing itself which was the problem, threatening legitimate forms of political expression, namely petitioning and voting. Petitions, the author said, could represent their petitioners' wants and grievances without prejudicing or giving offence to those who choose silently to undergo them. Addresses, in contrast, presumed to speak for whole communities, stigmatising those who prote protested against the content of these texts as, quote, peevish and clamorous. Worse, addresses directed at the Crown suggested that all law was dependent on, quote, the will and pleasure of the King, and that Parliament itself only existed upon the monarch's sufferance. The true voice of the Kingdom was delivered through Parliament via elections, Specific matters could be brought to the attention of Parliament through legitimate petitioning, but to address the Crown in the name of the Kingdom or people was to subvert the Constitution. Now, the broader challenge to representative institutions identified here could be connected to the observations of Peter Lake and Steve Pincus respecting the potential development in the reign of James II of a propaganda state dominated by a culture of public adulation of the crown. It's certainly true that writers and politicians in the 1680s intimated that petitioning was under threat from a court intolerant of the spontaneous expression of public opinion. But what I would argue that writers across the political spectrum really sought in the 1680s was the limitation and regulation of petitionary activity, not its suppression. Even Lestrange upheld private petitioning of authority for redress of grievances as being unquestionably lawful. But more than this, he was prepared to concede there were grey areas where private petitioning might become public. Those, he said, quote, mixed cases of public and private, as in the calamities of war, pestilence, fire, inundations and the like. And it's also evident that the court's opponents, as well as its supporters, sought to regulate and limitate ma limit mass petitioning. The second exclusion parliament, it's true, engaged in a strident defence of the subject's right, right to petition. But here we can contrast this defence with other activities during that particular parliament. There were significant parliamentary efforts with accompanying addressing and petitioning campaigns to reverse the penal laws against Protestant dissenters. There were no such attempts to repeal the 1661 Act against tumultuous petitioning. And both the opponents and also the supporters of the court were keen to attack petitioning and addressing on the basis of popularity. The impartial account, that pamphlet I'd mentioned earlier, claimed that those who signed addresses were, quote, persons of little interest, and most of them a very small and mean figure in the nation. Those law London apprentices who got that venison from Charles II were, uh, were similarly described as, quote, ruffians and beggarly vermin drawn in by pots of ale. Sorry about that. I don't have a, a watch on. 
So addresses were only legitimate uh, and, uh, and petitions were only legitimate, legitimate if they came from the gentry and freeholders of England and were directed at their representatives in Parliament. They were in turn confirmed and authorised by the election of these members to the Commons. These limitations on subscriptional activity, at least in relation to Parliament, were not altered by the Revolution of 1688. The English Bill of Rights reaffirmed the right of subjects to petition the Crown, yet the Revolution Settlement did not address the subject's right to petition Parliament. And in fact, the Act Against Tumultuous Petitioning remained in legal force in England until 1986. And it, in case you think it was just a dead letter, um, during the Grosvenor Square demonstrations against the Vietnam War, one MP asked whether this piece of legislation could be refashioned to deal with kind of tumultuous public demonstrations as well. Now, as you saw from that table from Mark Knight's book, mass petitioning and addressing campaigns continued into the early 18th century, and they continued to be vehicles for party polemic. But not only did these debates not fundamentally challenge the right to petition or address, but both Tory and Whig authors could once again be found defending these post-restoration limitations on popular petitioning and addressing. Mass addressing, uh, as I've shown, continued largely unabated. And in fact, it came to replace other subscriptional forms, such as the swearing of loyalty oaths, becoming the prime means of representing uh, public loyalty. And this is where I bring in my oath facts. Uh, so this is the last exercise of mass swearing of an oath of loyalty, the 1723 oaths to George I, issued after the 1722 Asbury plot. And if you've got very good eyesight, you might see that there are actually a number of women's names on this oath return. And that's one of the significant things about this exercise, is large numbers of women subscribers on uh, this return. For two reasons, really. Partly they wanted, you had to pay to subscribe, and they wanted to milk women subscribers as, as well as men and also because women have been associated with Jacobite activity and Jacobite riots and so on, so it's monitoring their loyalties as well. Now, as Paul Langford has argued, um, the state oath has become difficult to accommodate with a contemporary understanding of political life as primarily organised around an ideal of voluntary association. Loyal addresses, on the other hand, could capture popular support while appearing, at least, to be spontaneous and uncoerced. And they could even be used to represent indirectly those excluded by law and custom from the formal political process. If women them did not themselves sign addresses, they can notionally be included within the representation of the community as a whole. And this is a list of subscribers to a book collecting the addresses to George II. And again, you can see there are a number of women here who are leading subscribers to this text. The use of mass petitions and addresses to attempt to advance political and religious causes, however, remained controversial. The employment of these strategies by popular movements from the late 18th century onwards was resisted through the invocation of the statutory limitations and parliamentary protocols on mass petitioning. As Olivia Smith has demonstrate, demonstrated, these laws and regulations were employed to discredit the Chartist's million-strong national petitions, so they struck out a lot of them because women subscribers were on the list because they viewed some of the subscribe, uh, subscriptions as being illegitimate. And in hostile popular prints, connections but continue to be drawn between mass addressing and the memory of violent revolution. And here are a couple of examples. This is James Sayers, the address of the Protestant dissent, dissenting ministers from 1805. Uh, the figure at the front there is Abraham Rees, a leading Presbyterian minister who did in fact present uh, loyal addresses at the accession of George III and George IV. Um, and what you might be able to see, uh, you've got this text at the bottom which says, addressing knaves who sin and pray and kiss like Judas to betray. And up at the top there, sorry, there's a bit of a crease, this is the figure of Charles, II, uh, Charles I, rather, who's warning that this is actually a duplicitous address and these are the same regicidal dissenters who've always promised one thing and then done exactly the opposite. Uh, for a little bit later on, this is the loyal address or the procession of the Hampshire Hogs by James Gilray, uh, depicting uh, William Cobbett here, who's being accompanied by these, these hogs, hog-faced people. And you can see there's all this sort of French re revolutionary emblems around him. This is just at the moment where 
Cobbett is moving from being a loyalist writer to one who's starting to advocate political reform, and it's also satirising his, his kind of affectations of, of being a gentleman farmer as well. So there's kind of associations being made very strongly between more controversial addressing campaigns and a violent revolution. And it's this association between mass addressing and political loyalty or disloyalty which I want to return to in concluding. We should not see the addresses sent to Richard Cromwell as the early modern equivalent of an opinion poll. Clearly these texts do not provide straightforward evidence of public support for his regime. This doesn't mean, as some contemporary writers alleged, that these texts were worthless. What they captured instead was a wide range of political and religious opinion, revealing the factional and confessional divisions that would ultimately see the end of the protectorate. Equally, the difficulties in promoting these addresses, as evidenced in the case of Leicestershire, illustrate the importance for early modern governments of securing the loyalty of local elites and officeholders. Looking beyond the text of the addresses to the individuals who subscribe these documents provides us with an even more complex picture. Far from being texts generated by small cliques of the so-called well-affected, as some 17th century commentators alleged, the background of sus subscribers in Leicestershire was socially and intellectually diverse. The motivations behind subscription may have been equally varied, from clear ideological commitment to the protectoral regime to a less politically charged desire for stability and security. The last years of the interregnum were, though, of course, anything but stable. But if Richard's rule was brief, the memory of the addresses presented to him proved long-lasting. The particularly mnemonic form of the Loyal Address, with the reproduction of texts in newsletters, broadsheets and compendia, and the public ceremonial that accompanied their presentation, marked them out from other forms of subscriptional activity. As we've seen, the memory of addressing's Cromwellian origins was used to attack opponents, challenge alternative forms of subscriptional activity, and police the boundaries of popular involvement in the political process. More than this, the memory of early modern addressing activity as a whole facilitated the growth of a self-aware political public. Now here it should be acknowledged that Habermas himself denied that mass petitioning or addressing campaigns demonstrated the effective rule of public opinion instead characterising these campaigns as being, quote, mere acclamations of which the king made use. Here, however, I've argued that the involvement of the monarchical state or its quasi-republican equivalents in political debate was actually vital to the growth of a critical public sphere. Petitioning did indeed endorse the intervention of the political centre in the affairs of the periphery, as the historian Lex Hima van Vos has noted. But the regularity of these demonstrations of public loyalty also revealed the extent to which the reach of the early modern English state was conditional on its ability to negotiate effectively with local power brokers. As a result, demands for the public acclamation of a new ruler, such as Richard Cromwell, also presented opportunities for localities to place their own demands upon the political centre. Moreover, even though attacks on popularity and the involvement of the rabble remain commonplace, these campaigns acknowledged at a fundamental level that public opinion mattered. I've suggested here that the origins of this democratising process can be found in that brief period in the 1650s when England was ruled by neither a king or a queen. But it's surely significant, however, that in England the development of a democratic political culture was facilitated in part through public texts and rituals typically pledging loyalty to hereditary monarchy. For in the English political system, opposition must be loyal, and even atheist republicans, such as Jeremy Corbyn, must learn to genuflect before royalty. Thank you.
those of you who are frequent uh, attenders at these events know that we don't take questions from our speaker. Uh, Story. And he does so without shouting his originality, 
from the rooftop. Although I should say that I uh, remember our rooftops because I recorded that the very night when a pretty anarchist looking open rooftop bar in Budapest spent with him and Lenny. And we were there at the conference, by the way. And uh, to use two, two keywords to test the camera, I swear it, on work. The following day, when questioned about what had happened the night before, Ted, with his you know, characteristic, like, smile, he simply said that we were experimenting with radical drinking. <laughs> Finally, in an academic world increasingly obsessed with, or should I say, forced to be obsessed with, yes, I'm using the magic word here, impact. I think we can all agree that Ted Ballas, Professor Ted Ballas, has through his work made a decisive impact on the way in which we think about history, the way in which we think historically, which is, in the end, what really counts. Thank you all, and thank you.